Welcome back to the second session. Today, uh, we will be completing the last two books from our Old Testament. That is uh, the book of Zechariah and last book, Malachi. So before I could start uh, with presenting the book, we will see who is the author. Well, the, the author of this book, Zechariah, is Zechariah himself, who along with the prophet Haggai, encouraged the rebuilding of the temple, um, as we saw in the book of Ezra. And Zechariah was a priest as well as a prophet. And this grandfather was Ido, a priest who returned from exile with Zerubbabel. So apparently, Zechariah succeeded his grandfather as a head of that priestly family. And Zechariah would later be martyred on the temple grounds, and which we see that in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. And the very meaning of his name, Yahweh, uh, Zechariah means Yahweh remembers. So uh, the very purpose of his prophecy also relates to the meaning of his name that God remembers, remembers the promise towards his people, even after all the time we spent outside the land. So with this, I will just present the notes directly so that um, we can go through the notes. So here we see uh, uh, the chart about the complete book, the division of this book. There are about 14 chapters. And the first chapter, first chapter from verse 1 to verse 6, it talks about a call to repentance. And then, uh, you know, the, he also says he has this eight vision. Uh, Zechariah has eight vision. We can talk in detail later part of this book. Uh, the, the eight visions are covered from chapter 1 to chapter 6. And in uh, chapter 6, verse 9, it talks about the crowning of Joshua the high priest. And uh, from chapter 7 to 8, we see four messages have been given, questioning of the fast and uh, later the problems that's assigning and Israel's fasting. And, you know, it talks about Jerusalem and, and also talks about the uh, building of the temple and chapter 9 to 12 talks about um, cha chapter 9 to verse 14 yes there are two burdens one is in uh, chapter 9 10 and 11 talks about the first burden where the rejection of the messiah and then chapter 12 to 14 talks about the second burden the reign of the messiah the prediction and israel's future after building the we also see the date where it was written. It was written probably in 520 BC when Zechariah and Haggai became encouraging towards the, began to encourage the rebuilding of the temple. And in 515, when the rebuilding was completed, this final prophecies which has been uh, recorded in chapter 9 to 14 from the latter, probably about 480 BC. Uh, the very purpose of this book, Zechariah, is to encourage the rebuilding of the temple, to give instruction and in holiness, rebuild lives would result in rebuild temple, to provide specific information concerning both the first and second coming of so future restoration of Judah. And there's a unique feature been recorded for its length. Yes, this is one of the, you know, the minor book, but then it has 14 chapters. It gives more Christ-centered prophecies than any other Old Testament book has. And it also is quoted uh, by other Bible books more than any other Old Testament book. And we also see the comparison of Christ in this book. So very clearly we see the Messianic passages uh, you know, abound in this book that Christ is portrayed in two advents as both the servant and the king, the man and the God. 
So there are, there's a falling of the few of Zechariah's explicit anticipation of Christ, that is, the angel of the Lord, the righteous branch. Somebody is come, I was admitting them. Yeah, you see the righteous branch, and then um, in, in chapter 3, verse 9, we see the stone uh, with seven eyes, and the high, it talks about uh, the king, priest, the humble king, the cornerstone, the tent peg, band, the battle bow, the good shepherd who's rejected and sold for 30 shekels of silver, the prize of the slave, the pierced one, the cleansing fountain, the smitten shepherd who's abandoned, the coming judge and the righteous king. So every title that we read right now, which is recorded in the book of Zechariah denotes Christ in himself. So with this, um, we can see uh, what this book talks about. Let me stop presenting. We can read some of the key verses before we could get into the eight visions and we can see how Christ is portrayed in each. Well, the eight verses here, uh, sorry, uh, the four verse, uh, key verses here. Can I request four of us to please read each verse? Zechariah chapter 1 verse 3, therefore tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says, return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Can I request Quickly, we can finish four people. Rosalind, Divya, and uh, yeah, anyone else, brother Isaac, Enoch, anyone, please go ahead and read. Uh, can I read? Can I read? Yes, brother, please. Zachariah 7.13 When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord. Says the Lord. Says the Lord. Says the Lord. Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 7 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, and test them like gold. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for each one of us taking turn and reading, because it's very important for us to read, so that we know the scriptures are speaking to us. In fact, we see that time and again when the prophets read the scriptures loud and it impacted the people around them. So that is one of the reasons why it's good for us to read the scriptures. Well, um, Zephaniah 9.9 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Your king comes to you. Who is righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the donkey. We see this pro uh, prophecy that fulfilled in the New Testament that Jesus coming on a colt. And then uh, we also see uh, in 13.9, this third I will bring into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. And they will call on my name and I will answer them. And I will say, they are my people and they will say, the Lord is our God. What a declaration that we can apply to our life even today. So with this, we will just uh, in brief 
uh, go through the book of Zechariah because Zechariah uh, uses a series of eight visions, four messages, and uh, and it also has two burdens at the end that we saw, uh, where the future plan for this covenant people uh, for a dozen of years or more, the task of rebuilding the temple has been half completed, and Zechariah is commissioned by God to encourage the people in their unfinished responsibility. So just like how Zechariah is commissioned by God, today you and I also are commissioned by God to encourage people around us. Encouragement is a gift that God has given each one of us to exhort. And here we see Zechariah exhorting them to action with strong words of rebuke, correction, and Zechariah seeks to encourage them at the same time. As he rebukes and tries to correct them, he is words, he's also using words to encourage them to get into action by reminding them of the future importance of the temple. And the temple must be rebuilt. For one day, the Messiah will come in his glory to inhabit it. But the future blessing is contingent upon the present. Obedience. So he exhorts people saying obedience, through obedience is what we are, we will be blessed. And this is also for you and, I, you and me. We can also take this, that through obedience we can inherit the blessing of God. So the people are not merely building a temple, but then they are building a future. They are bringing the restoration of Jerusalem, restoration of Israel. And with that, uh, uh, they are motivated and they are uh, entering into the uh, into the plan of welcoming Messiah, uh, welcoming the coming Messiah. So the first eight chapters were written to encourage us in rebuilding the temple. And uh, later when we see the whole 14 chapters, okay, uh, talks about uh, or teaches us the salvation uh, will be obtained by God. the last chapter. Uh, it talks about people from all over the world coming to worship God. So when this when this temple of God has been built and restored, Zechariah exhorts people and he says, people will come from all over the nation. They will come here to worship God. And just like he said, it is so true, even now. And, uh, you know, who desires that all people will follow him. And this is not the doctrine of universalism, but but all people would be saved because it is God's nature to save us. Rather, the book teaches that God desires that all people worship God and accept those who do, regardless of their nation or the uh, political agenda. Finally, Zechariah preached that God is sovereign over this world. God is above everything. Any kind of appearance to the contrary or notwithstanding, his vision of the future indicates that God sees all that will happen. And the, and the depictions of uh, uh, God's intervention into this world will teach that ultimately that he will bring the human events to, to end and he will choose. And he does not eliminate the individual's freedom to follow God or rebel, but holds people responsible for the choices that they make. So everyone will have to face the consequence of the uh, choices that, make, that they make. That's why we need to watch over the life. Book of Haggai spoke about it. Watch over your life. Watch over your way that you lead your life. So in the last chapter, even it forces of the nature respond to God's control. And here we also see the foreshadow of the prophecy of Jesus Christ and the messianic era abound in Zechariah, which we just went through. And we also see the eight visions in, uh, you know, one missing I will just share now. Eight visions that has been listed in the book of Zechariah. Uh, the first one is the horseman among the murky trees, which is recorded in chapter 1, verse 1 to 17. And the second vision is the four horns and four craftsmen. And the third one is the survivor. 
So we go. The fourth is the vision of Joshua, who is the high priest. And the fifth is the golden lampstand and two olive trees. Six is the flying scrolls. And the seventh one is the women in the basket. And the eighth is four chariots. When Zechariah begins this book, it was a strong call for the Israel to repent. And the theme of this book is repentance is developed more fully for the eight visions. So in general, these, uh, these visions speak of God's plan for Israel, especially for Jerusalem and the temple. Another major theme uh, is the coming of the future Messiah. The prophet also had a mission of encouraging the post exilic Jews to continue their work to rebuild the temple. So here in these three visions, we see that just give me a minute. Yeah, the first one, the horseman among the myrtle trees. So Zechariah sees a man and horses among the trees. So here we see that the man explains that they had gone throughout the whole earth and found peace. An angel tell, uh, then tells the prophet Zechariah that God still loved Israel and would restore Jerusalem in verse 17. And he summarizes that this is what the Lord Almighty says, my town will again overflow with prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. You see, God always stands. He's a God of restoration. No matter how much people would have sinned and gone too far from him, but God is a God, he restores his people, he waits for them to repent and change. And he restores them back. He just doesn't restore us, but he'll also bless us with prosperity and comfort. And in uh, the second vision, he talks about the four horn and the four craftsmen. Here we see Zechariah uh, shown four horn and four craftsmen. As the angel te uh, tells him that the horns are four kingdoms that opposed Israel. That is Syria, Egypt, Babylon, and Persia. And the craftsmen are coming to throw down these horns. That is, God will defeat Israel's end. God will stand. God himself will fight every battle that Israel faces. Not only then, even now, God fights our battle. He stands for us. But says, I will not watch enemies overtake you. God will not spare the enemies who are trying to harm his children. He watches over us and he guards us from our enemies. He is a strong one. He is a God who is our refuge. And the third vision, the servior. Zechariah sees a man holding a measuring line. When the prophet asks the man, where is he going? The man says he is going to measure the city of Jerusalem. And this very vision represents God's promise that Jerusalem will be expanded. And its people will one day live in safety as the Lord judges Israel's head. What a great comfort that this word would bring, this prophecy would bring to the people of Israel. Because the time and season when they were it was not good. They didn't have the wall to protect them. It was in the state of ruin. But then Zechariah releases the comfort of God's promise to them, saying that God will expand Jerusalem and you know people will live in safety. And the Lord will judge Israel's enemy. So the fourth vision comes a vision of Joshua, who was the high priest. So Zechariah sees that Joshua, the high priest, standing in the filthy clothes. He is before the angel of the Lord. And the Satan stands to the side and Satan is rebuked. And Joshua is given rich, clean clothes. So God himself explains this vision to Zechariah saying that Joshua will be blessed in his service to the Lord. Amen. A blessing, isn't it? The vision is also symbolic of Israel's restoration as God's 
priestly nation. The vision of Joshua ends with the prediction of the ultimate high priest. Who's the ultimate high priest? The coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. Symbolized by a branch and an all-seen seeing stone. With that, we'll move on to the fifth one, the golden lampstand and two olive trees. Here we see an angel shows Zechariah a golden lampstand being uh, fed oil from two olive trees. The two olive trees uh, are symbolic of Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. And the other one is Joshua, who is the high priest. So the golden lampstand represents the temple and the temple worshipping community. So God was making the point that he would once again work through his people to lay the foundation of the temple and finish the work. You see, God himself does everything. He stores back the temple and the worship. So the sixth vision says a flying scroll. So Zechariah sees a large scroll written on both sides and flying over the whole land. This vision speaks of God's judgment upon those who disobey his law. Very important. And the seventh one is the woman in the basket. The angel shows a prophet a basket that, uh, that could hold an ifa, that is a three-fifth of a bushel. On the basket is a lead covered. The angel opens a basket to reveal a woman sitting inside. And the angel says, this is the iniquity of the people throughout the land and seals the basket again with the heavy lid. Two other women appear with the stroke-like wings. They pick up the basket and carry it to Babylon. This strange vision pictures suppressed wickedness to be banished to Babylon, where it would be eventually be freed. We also relate this reference to Revelation chapter 17. We can go through it in our personal time, study time. And the last one, the four chariots. The four chariots, Zechariah sees four horses of uh, different colors pulling four chariots. And they quickly run through the entire earth with the result that God's spirit has rest. And this vision represents a judgment upon the enemies of Israel. After the judgment, God's wrath will be appeased and rest and ensures. This final vision brings the series of vision full circle. The first vision that pictures these horses uh, at the end of their mission. A similar vision of judgment also using the imagery of God's that is found in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. So the two in the middle vision, which is number four and five, the vision of Joshua, the high priest, and the gold lampstand, and the two olive trees, emphasizes God's blessing. As Israel returns to Jerusalem and rebuilds the temple, they will find God's favor. The work will be accomplished, not by might, not by power. By the Spirit, says the Lord Almighty, which is a very uh, uh, powerful scripture and also been claimed a long time, uh, been, uh, been, uh, been um, claimed by many. And this is also, uh, it is one of the main key verse from this book that not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. So from this book, what how we can uh, what we can carry or learn from this book is God is expecting us to have a sincere worship and a moral living today. As Zechariah gives us an example of breaking through, uh, you know, many visions and many messages that he is asking us, set a heart right before God. And he is also giving the invitation, God's invitation of salvation to people of all nation origin, people from all over the world, despite the language, race and culture. 
that salvation is only available through the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed on the cross, who died for us, so that we can be restored. We can, our sins will be washed, our sins will be forgiven, and we can be restored back to God. So there is no other name under heaven by which a man can be saved, but there is only uh, salvation through Jesus Christ. The eternal life that we can receive is only through Jesus Christ. So this is the message that we can learn and carry it from this book. So before we could move on to the next book, um, class, just feel free um, you know, to share the learning from this book. Any of the scriptures that has affected you, encouraged you, please feel free to share it in the class, which will help all of us. Before we could move on to the next book, Malachi. Anyone would like to share? Okay, so uh, I'll just present the slides. Malachi. Yeah. So this is the last book of our Old Testament. Malachi was the author of this book and his name means messenger. And it appears in chapter 3 verse 1. So this book was written about 430 BC and the meaning of his name is Malachi. Malachi means my messenger is probably a shortened form of Malachia, messenger of Yahweh in Hebrew. And it is appropriate uh, to the book which speaks of the coming of the messenger of the covenant. So Malachi, a prophet in the days of Nehemiah, directs his message of judgment to a people who are plagued with corrupt priests, wicked practices, and a false sense of security in their privileged relationship with God. So using the question and answer method, Malachi probes deeply into the problem of hypocrisy, uh, infidelity and mixed marriages, divorce, false worship and arrogance. So sinful as the nation becomes that God's word to the people no longer have any for 400 years after Malachi's ringing condemnation or uh, uh, proclaiming condemnation to God's people, uh, God remains silent. Only with the coming of John the Baptist in, uh, in chapter 3, 1, does God again communicate to his people through a prophetic voice. So with this, I just present our notes. So this book has four chapters and the chapters are divided by, uh, you know, like the first chapter one to uh, verse one to five talks about the privilege of the nation. It also talks about the love of God for the nation, the care of God. And in chapter one, verse six, six onwards, uh, the second half of the first chapter talks about the uh, population of the nation, the sin, uh, pollution of the nation, sorry, uh, the sin of the priest which is present, complaining against God. And in chapter 2, it talks about the sin of the people. Sin of the people. And in chapter 3, verse 16 onwards, um, chapter 3 to 4 on whole talks about the promise to the nation. And chapter 
3 verse 16 to about uh, chapter 4 talks about the book of remembrance and the coming of Christ in chapter 4 talks about the coming of Elijah, the future, the coming of God. So the uh, the book that it was written is in Jerusalem and the time period is about 4 uh, 432 BC to about 425 BC. The very purpose of this book we see is to rebuke the profaning of that which is holy and to rebuke the abuse of proper human relationships to announce both the judgment and the blessings of the coming day of the Lord. To teach that sin and apostasy will bring judgment and repentance brings blessing. To bring out some of the sins of people and their spiritual leaders. To teach about God's sovereignty and to give predictions about Messiah. And the unique of this book is, again, it's a length. And Malachi includes more questions, about 25, than any other book in the Bible, including perhaps the most famous one. Will a man rob God? Will a man God. This book also talks about the tithing, giving unto God. It contains the most famous Old Testament passage on giving and tithing. And we see the uh, foreshadow of Christ in this book. is um, uh, about 400 years of prophetic silence, broken finally by the words of the next prophet, that is John the Baptist, where we see in John chapter 1, verse 29, it's recorded saying that, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Malachi predicts the coming of the messenger who will clear the way before the Lord. And again, John the Baptist later fulfills this prophecy by the next few verses saying, Jump ahead to Christ the second advent. This is also true of the prophecy of the appearance of Elijah the prophet. And John the Baptist was this Elijah. But Elijah will also appear before the second coming of Christ. Yes, there were more things. We will read some of the key verses of this book. Can I request any two of us to please read the key verses of this book? Malachi 1 verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. It is you, O priest, who show contempt for my name. Amen. Malachi 3, verses 6 and 7. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Amen. Malachi wrote the words of the Lord to God's chosen people who had gone astray. Especially the priests who had turned from the Lord. And priests were not treating the sacrifices the way they are supposed to. The way to make God serious. And the animals with blemishes were being sacrificed. And even though the Lord demanded the animals need to be spotless without any defect to be sacrificed, but then the Levites, they went ahead and sacrificed. The men of Judah were dealing with the wives of the youth treacherously and wondering why God would not accept their sacrifice. And also people were not tithing as they should have been. Because all these instructions are not new for the people of Israel. Because 
God had instructed them in the book of Leviticus chapter 27, 30 and also in verse 32, we read that God has already instructed them, giving them the complete instruction how the sacrifice needs to be done, how they need to conduct themselves, how a Levite um, need to conduct themselves during the sacrifice and how the people of Israel should offer the sacrifice and the type thing. It's already been instructed, recorded and told up. But the people... The way we live their lives, uh, they stop reading the Torah, stop reading the scripture, and uh, the people from different generations forgotten of what the Lord did. Time and again, the uh, God raised prophets to uh, declare, to inform them, to proclaim how how majestic our God is, how miraculously they were saved, they were brought, and you know, trying to instill uh, word Torah into them. But in spite of all this, people were doing what they were doing because they were, their very nature was uh, corrupted. Corrupted as they were in exile, living among the pagan people. So the pagan nature started uh, being inculcated in them. So we see that even though they were returned from exile, but still their activities, their daily living, the way they live their life, add those traces in their, in their daily life. So time and again, the prophets need to remind them, to correct them. And when the people were not fighting on time and they were reminded about the book of Leviticus, and that's the reason where um, you know God demands. How can you can a man rob God? But in spite of all people sin and turning away from God, Malachi reiterates God's love for His people. Can we repay God in any ways? But despite our nature. Not only the nature of the Israelites in those days, but even in our time. Despite our nature, God is saying, my love abounds. Where sin abounds, my love abounds much more. So Malachi retreats saying, God's love for his people increases. And this promises of coming messenger. God, looking at all these people, he says, there's a Messiah who's coming. I love my people. Time and again, we can focus on John 3.16. How much God loves his people, despite the very sinful nature of this. Yes, the practical application that we can take from this book is, God is not pleased when we do not obey his commands. He will repay those who disgrace him, as for God's uh, like, you know, things which were not good in those days, like they were, um, you know, uh, getting married to other culture women, the pagan women and getting divorced. But God is saying, I hate divorce. God takes a covenant of marriage seriously and he does not want it to be broken. And we are to stay true to the spouse of a youth for a lifetime. It was there within people, but then as they got married to the pagan women and their culture, their lifestyle started becoming different. It was defiling to the nature of God, the very nature of God. So God sees today our hearts so that he knows what our intentions are. Nothing can be hidden from God and we all know it. Even when it comes to offering, even when it comes to tithing, yes, in the Old Testament we see that 10% need to be given, but in the New Testament it's not like that. It is the love offering where we can give more than 10%. It is not something like we give 10% or less than 10%. No. Love offering is something willingly we offer to God. God, what you have blessed me, here I'm offering back to you from what you have given. And I've heard many testimonies where no one has gone into loss by giving up to God. God has prospered everyone. So in this book, we see that um, this is the only area where God says, you give and destiny. 
you give and test me. No other ever God says you give and test me. You do this and then you test me. No. In this era, God says you give and then test. Give unto the Lord willingly. It's not we are giving from what we have. We are giving God what he has given to us. And when we don't give God willingly or, or rightfully what belongs to God, it is like we are robbing God's portion. So we need to come to God willingly, thankful hearted. Lord, I thank you for blessing the work of our hands. Even the very wisdom to do our work comes from God. There is no way that we could take credit for anything in us. Anything. It is the grace of God that you and I are there, are living. We can't take credit for the wisdom that I worked hard. Yes, some people claim that I work with my hard earned money. It is my work that has brought me promotion. It is my work that, you know, built my family, the way we live. But then Lord is reminding us, it is me. I'm the God who will bless you. I'm the Lord who will promote you. I'm the Lord who's giving you the wisdom, the very source from which you're earning everything is the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding. He's the source of everything and we are getting it from him. Man at all times should not forget the source from God. And one thing that we need to know again and again is to humble ourselves out of the hands of God and give him all the credit because as a man we are a created being. We are not the creator to take all the credit. We are a created being. Everything that we do in our life is a grace that God has given us. It's only through his grace, through his gifts, we are able to do what we are able to do. So we need to give all glory, all honor to God. And this is something that, you know, at the end of the uh, Old Testament survey book, I would like to share with each one of us is that let's humble ourselves under the hand of God. No matter how much we would have studied or what experience that each one of us we will we may hold on to our background. But one thing that we need to give all glory is to God that He has placed us there. More than anyone, I guess we realize the realize the time of life. The breath, the very breath that we breathe. Sometime back, we went through the pandemic season and we know the value of this breath. People ran around the places for the oxygen cylinder, the very breath that we are breathing, that we need to be so thankful to God. We need to give all glory to God. No matter which place we are, no matter how high God lifts us in season, but let's say, Lord, all this belongs to you. Even when we are in the place, we give you all, all glory, all honor. And even when the time you lift us up, we give you all glory and honor, all honor. All this belongs to you. Because if you are enabled to do something, it's your wisdom, it's your knowledge, and it's in your understanding that we are able to perform what we are able to do. It. It's nothing of our own. Because we are just the handmaid of God. We are just a vessel in God's hand. If we are honored by somebody, praise God. Even that belongs to God. Because He is dwelling with each of us. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's honor. Praise God. With this, we come to the conclusion of this book saying that, you know, let's give all glory, honor, and in all the blessing that God has blessed us with, let's give our tithe and offering unto God and his people generously, you know, willingly, generously, happily, so that we can inherit the blessing that is there in Okay, because the scripture also says even a glass of water if it's given to a prophet, the blessing of that prophet will be it. So if God is, uh, you know, blessing us, even in the small things, how much more that you and I can expect when we honor God and his people, his children around us in much better way, the offering, when we give it to the poor, 
it is like giving up to the Lord. That's what the scripture says. So here, the book of Malachi talks about more on the giving and generous giving. Uh, you know, the New Testament talks about uh, you know, unmeasurably give more. Don't measure and give, but give more. In we giving, we will also receive that way. And we can expect that all from God. And also he says, let not your uh, left hand know what your right hand is doing. In all our giving, do it secretly. That's okay if no one has been watching, no one has seen. See, we don't have to receive any kind of reward or plot from people. But then let's see God in everything, in everything. So it's not only the material things that it talks about giving, typing and all, but then giving can be even in that form of time, given to the Lord in form of time, then to pray and also by sharing the gospel with others, uh, spreading the good news with others because we are in the last days and it's time for us to stir ourselves as we are being equipped. We, the leaders, uh, whom God has chosen, God has appointed, because the scripture says the harvest is you, the laborers of you, and God has uh, called us as the laborers, and he's also in the process of equipping us. So as we have been equipped, see for opportunities also to serve God in different ways. And in ABC, at our church, at our college, we believe that every uh, every minister, every believer is a minister of God. Every believer is a minister of God. So do not wait for your graduation day for you to get graduated, receive a certificate, and then step out and serve the Lord or to minister to others. But then it's your time now. Now is your time. As you are equipped, as the Lord speaks, share to others. Share among your own circle. God will open doors. God will open opportunities when we seek Him. Let's be His mouthpiece. Amen. So that's what this book of Malachi is, Zechariah and Malachi. So I hope leave this uh, uh, class open to all. So where you can share your learning from these two books and overall how the sessions were, what we learned personally. Please go ahead. Anyone, John, Brother Bubakar, Divya, Enoch, please feel free to share. Thank you, Divya. Thank you. Brother Abhina, Avadesh, just go ahead, Anita. Anyone, Rabika, just share what you learned. How was this time of learning Old Testament survey been to you? Sid. Can I share? Uh, I just want to uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, just for giving us uh, uh, the overall, you know, the survey of the assessment it had been uh, very clear. And uh, thank you so much. It has given a new perspective to learn the Bible. Um, praying that uh, it will help us in our, you know, walk with the Lord. Yeah, thank you so much. And God bless you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you so thank much, you. my own pastor. I appreciate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love this group. I want to use the opportunity to say thank you for wishing me happy birthday on the 11th of uh, November. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure belated wishes in love. 11th of November was your birthday. Okay, today as we sign off, we will also be a blessing away, you know? Okay. John, can I request right. you to please and also pray for Enoch as well? Sure. Yeah. Gracious Lord, we want to thank you for this time you've given us. Thank you for the time of learning. 
Thank you for um, helping Pastor Diana to take us through the entire books of Old Testament and revealing your heart behind each book, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for the time of learning that we had together as a class. Um, we thank you for all the mysteries that you have been revealing all these days. And we ask, Lord, that we would be able to continue to take this in our lives and help us to understand more of your understanding, more of your wisdom, um, to apply that in our personal work uh, with you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we also uh, take this time to submit uh, Brother Enoch to your mighty hands. Thank you for his life. Thank you for adding one more year to his life, for oh God. Thank you for all the mercies that you have been showing in his life. And we pray and we declare that the blessings of the Lord rest upon him whenever he walks into his house. Let him be blessed. When he walks out of his house, let him be blessed. And everything that he touches, may your grace, may your favor be upon him, O oh Lord. Eternal God is uh, your refuge and underneath our everlasting arms. That's your promise, O oh God, and we thank you that you are with him, O oh God. We praise you for his life. We also submit all of us once again to your hands, O oh God. We thank you for the privilege that you have given us to serve you. And uh, all the areas of our lives, we pray, O oh God, that we would be able to honor you and give you the best of our life, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' most precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Thank you, Ma. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. As I thought, I also learned a lot from this book. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.